Welcome to episode 200 of Saturday Football Uncensored, brought to you by Saturday Down South and Texas Pete. On today's episode, we preview week six and welcome on special guest Billy Lucci to break down the Texas A&M-Alabama game, plus we give you our best bets. You can find this show on our website, SaturdayDownSouth.com and Apple and Spotify. Don't forget to join us for the live recording of the show every Sunday night at 8 Eastern time on the Saturday Down South YouTube page. Go share the pod with your friends, everyone. We're looking to expand the show. We've done a really good job of it so far. We look to continue our expansion. Find clips from the show on Twitter, at SatDownSouth, and at SatFBUncensored, on Instagram and TikTok, at SaturdayDownSouth, and you can find us on YouTube at Saturday Down South. And now, here's the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Saturday Football Uncensored, brought to you by Saturday Down South in Texas Pete. I'm your host, Tyler Huck, and with me, as always, my co-host and my overall wearing friend, Chris Marler. I'm wearing overalls, Tyler, because the dynasty is about to be over all all and done if you get yeah. catch my drift oh i do brother hell right okay it's gonna be a tough week for me um what's going on man nothing since so our 200th episode which is awesome that part's really cool. cool yeah uh very very grateful that not only you uh have been a part of this and that we've been able to do this for now for this is our third season yeah. um and then also really thankful to the audience, obviously, for listening and sticking with it and all that kind of stuff and, and uh, not getting tired of, I would say, us, but mainly just me. Um, and yeah, this is I awesome. I have my man. detractors now. What's that? I said I have my detractors now. You do, which is against all odds. I did not <laughs> see that coming. I will also say <laughs> it's, it's to our 200th episode, but how about the fact that today we're recording this on Wednesday, October the 4th, right? Yep. There are... There's football on, whether it's college or pro, every single day for the next 49 days. That is a beautiful, beautiful thing. I can't wait. We get matching starting on Tuesday night next week. Unreal. Love it. Uh, Pretty good slate this week as well. I'm excited to talk about it. Um, There's some really big games on the slate, including Alabama and A&M, which we will be bringing on our special guest, Billy Lucci, uh, to talk Texas A&M. Um, before we get into the games, though, there was an interesting clip that started going around. I, was, I wanted to play it for you and get your thoughts. This is uh, Kirby Smart talking at his press conference recently this week ahead of the Kentucky game. I think every SEC team should be ranked. I guarantee you there's some teams that don't want to play them that are ranked. I mean, I don't, I don't, I literally have no idea what you're referencing because every team we play in the SEC is good enough to beat us. And whether they're ranked or not, I could care less. I'm trying to be more physical than them and outscore them. Let me start that over because I just wanted to point out the little <laughs> laugh from one of the one of the. Well, let's just listen at the very beginning. I, I think every SEC team should be ranked. I guarantee you, there's some teams that don't want to play when they're ranked. <laughs> yeah, uh, there's not there's not a noise that embodies. Georgia fans more right now than <laughs> so bitter already. Um, okay, so let's get into this for a second because I thought it was it was stupid as shit. Uh, every SEC team should be ranked. Now, how do you want to approach this? Because I heard all offseason when Saban would say something, it was never like from, from this specific fan base. He's done. He's retiring. He's past his prime. Dynasty's dead. Blah, 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 blah. And, and like other people would be like, oh, you know, like, like he smiled, he smiled. So you know what that means? Like that, like they're going to go undefeated. Yeah. And so now Kirby comes in, like, what, what were your thoughts on why he said this? Cause I thought it was dumb as shit. Um, I think he's probably heard a lot of the talk about their schedule being soft yeah. and he's, this is his effort to kind of pump that up a little bit and, yeah, sure. I, I guess South Carolina and Vandy are, should be ranked. Should they? <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't. So what's crazy to me is, and we talked about this, uh, I think, on the Sunday pod. It, like, listen, if he's motivating his team, because that was like the resounding thing that I got from people. He's motivating his team. 
with what part? Like, what's he saying that's motivating his team? Hey, all your all the teams we're going to play could beat you. Any logical person can look at that schedule and be like, eh, Vandy? Mm. No. Vandy's gained, I want to say, I'm, I'm, I'm almost positive this is accurate. Vandy has gained less than 160 yards combined against Georgia in their past two years. Like, that's the level of, of, of dominance they've had in that game. Um, any given Saturday, bro. You could lose any 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 game in the SEC. That's what Kirby said. I there's I would love to see them lose to Vandy. That like out of all the teams, out of all the teams, like that would be my favorite, probably. Like that would probably be my favorite one. Um, no, I, I think it's like I, I get what he's trying to do and trying to motivate him. It seemed kind of odd because I don't know the full context of what like the question was. Like he's I think I think part of it is he's trying to save face about the Auburn game. And I think you're the other part is right. Like I think Kirby if we want to spin this in a way that's like Kirby is in, in like full on positive PR mode, right? It's optimistic October. Like I said on Sunday. So if we want to go that route, let's go that route. If you want to go that route, then what we're trying to, he's probably trying to do is, is realize that like, I don't think he has any room for error. There's talk now from a national standpoint, like if he loses in Atlanta, they're not going to go to, the national championship or the playoff. Like if they go 12 and 0 and they lose in Atlanta to a good team with the way the schedule is, there's, there's, it's possible they don't get to the playoff. Now I think that's kind of crazy, but I mean, like, I think he's, he kind of realized the writing on the wall is like, you have very little room for error, very little room for error because you're not going to, I just, you're not going to go to like skate to the schedule, I guess for one. And then two, you're not going to go like get anybody's like, no one's gonna make an excuse for you. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I think it's becoming a pretty national narrative on their schedule. And look, part of it is just that they're just they've recruited that well as opposed to everyone else in their division. That yeah, it's yeah. I, I I don't think it would be as easy of a schedule for every team out there. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, um, the way they've looked, back to back national champs, you know, if you want the benefit of the doubt in the polls to matter from last year, then you're also gonna get not going to get the benefit of the doubt when people are like, look at your schedule compared to right. you winning two straight championships. Even though this version of the dogs, I don't think is nearly as good as two years ago or as good as last year. Yeah. Else I was wrong. Georgia has beaten Vanderbilt. Uh, they've held them to 227 total yards in the last two years. They have beat combined for the two games, in the two games that, yeah, they've actually beaten them. Um, by a combined 117 to nothing. <laughs> Rank them bitches. Weird. Whatever. All right. We want to get into the, the, the week slate. I'm excited about this week. I am too. Let's get into Oklahoma, Texas first, and then we'll get into Bama A&M. Love it. Um, mm-hmm. Okay. So this game, what do you, th- first off, it's, it's, is it noon every single year? It is, right? Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? I feel like this should be a night game. No, I don't think it should be a night game because it's at the state fair. Um, I like the noon part. It's kind of like noon. I'm sure it's had some 3.30 starts. Um, I love this game because it's like a national game on ABC. This this specific week, the second week of October, used to be my all-time favorite week of the year every year. Miami would play Florida State. Texas would play Oklahoma. Bama was usually off before they played Tennessee. And then you had Georgia-Tennessee – Florida LSU is like always a great year. And there's a really good slate this week, even though those a lot of those games aren't being played. Um, I think they should keep it at 12. I've heard people say, and maybe this is something we see when they come to the SEC, that it kind of makes sense to play the game on campus at some point. Because, you know, like I, I like it's just an odd setup, I guess. Like it, like I always I always hey, that's what me up. Florida do. Yeah, but like okay. See have you have you been to like a, a state fair? <laughs> um, I want to say yes. I think I've been to the Georgia. Is it is the Georgia State Fair in Perry? I think so. I've been to that. Okay. I can't imagine a football game being played there. So the state fair in South Carolina is like it's outside of Williams Bryce. Like the, all the parking for Williams Bryce is the state fairgrounds. Okay. And I'll never forget like 2008. It was like yeah. South Carolina's got LSU coming to town and boys and men's playing the next night at the state fair. And I'm like, what in the actual fuck is life right now? Like what is happening? I'll um, be there. I'll be- <laughs> it's right. 
um, on bended knee. So this this part's always funny to me because like they'll like all the B roll. It's like the most Americana shit ever. Like everybody comes out with what I refer to as like a Six Flags body, where it's like you know what I'm saying. Like where they have like everyone's like built like Garfield the cat, and they have like a front butt. And yeah. it's usually like somehow yeah. being like lassoed together or like around from like a pair of like Levi's that's way too big for anyone else. I, I got and everyone's always eating funnel cake. There's like fucking funnel cake and deep fried yeah. like carburetors. Oreos. Yeah. Also that <laughs> carburetors, whatever. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, all right. So this is uh 12 p.m. ABC, number 12 Oklahoma versus number three Texas. Texas currently a six and a half point favorite, total 60 and a half. Yeah, uh, this is the 43rd time in this matchup that both teams have been ranked. I would say Texas has a little more big game experience this season with the road victory over Bama. Oklahoma hasn't really been tested this year, yeah. um, but advanced metrics wise, their offense and defense are very good. Yeah, um, there's a revenge factor in this game. Um, last year, Texas won 49 to zero. Dylan Gabriel. Also didn't get to play in that game, so this is his first Red River Red. Wow, I can't say it, Chris. Red River rivalry. Red River rivalry. Wait, 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 wait. Um, Quinn Ewers. Obviously, the story has been about him this year. He's been awesome. Sixty-six percent completion rate, almost fourteen hundred yards, ten touchdowns, one pick, another yeah, five yeah. on the ground. Dylan Gabriel. Gabriel actually has probably even better numbers. Seventy-five uh, percent completion rate. Mm-hmm. 1600 yards passing 15 touchdowns two picks four rushing touchdowns yeah as yeah. as good as both of these offenses are um both defenses have been really good too this is going to be a really good game um analytically i, I think it it's it kind of sh- paints the picture that oklahoma likes to kill you through the air but texas mm-hmm. is top 15 in defensive pass success rate allowed so i think that both offenses are going to score in this game, but I think Texas is a little bit more power on defense than Oklahoma. Um, and I like to, I think Oklahoma will cover the spread, but I'll take Texas to win 35, 32. Yeah. 35, 32. Okay. So yeah, this is one of those games where it has the five and a half point spread, which I hate. Everyone knows yeah. that if you listen to the podcast for however many years, everyone knows that. Well, it's six and um, a half now, which is good, which is interesting because it moved up. It was also six and a half last year going into this game. Ooh. And yeah, and and this is this has also been I feel like, and I could be wrong, but I feel like this has been a game, especially in the last two years, where it has really dictated the rest of the season. Like in the last two years, especially like like two years ago, you had Caleb Williams come off the bench and had this crazy comeback. I wonder where Sark and this program is then or now. I guess like even even more so than like like I wonder if there's a little bit more staying power from a fan base standpoint um, and like how people view them if they win that game a couple of years ago, I don't know. Um, I, I think that Oklahoma has been like really impressive. Like, like for however, or for whatever reason you look at that, that logo and that brand, the fact that they're able to fly under the radar is shocking to me. And they've been able to do that. And like, you look at whether you want to look at like their, their resume and like, all right, what's the strength of schedule for this, this team? Like Texas has a top 20 strength of schedule. Oklahoma's 82nd, right? Like, like right. they haven't played anybody. They went on the road and they struggled mightily, um with cincinnati and you know like i i think last week they put up like 40 points in the first half there's games this year albeit against inferior competition there's been games this year where it's like they might score 100 points like 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 i genuinely thought i'm like like at one point i think against someone early on they they, i think it might have been smu or somebody i mean they they put up 28 points in the first half and like almost and i think they had like 35 by 12 minutes in or like 12 minutes in the second quarter. Like they, they put up some points. I think Texas is built more similarly, not good at that word, um, to a college football playoff contending team than OU. And that could just be because I'm biased towards Texas, which I admittedly am this year. I'm very high on Texas. Um, but the way the defensive line plays, the way that this team is able to get out there, we haven't had a situation at all this season where Texas has not only had a letdown, where they've been close to a letdown. Maybe the first half against Wyoming, coming off a huge win against Bama, but they pull away like by a ton in the second half. Even the shit with Kansas. Kansas is a, a ranked team coming in, going to play them last week. The only reason they were even scoring was kind of like fluky plays in the first half, and then they pull away from them. Like 
anytime a team had over 300 yards of offense or 300 yards rushing and passing, that's crazy to me. Texas and Ole Miss both did it last week. Like, just get – you have to just get through this game if you're Texas. Like, because I, I do wonder the psyche for the program, if they don't win this game, are they going to start allowing the outside noise in of like, okay, you, you do what Texas always does and you blew your big shot. And, and like, and does that make, does that lead to another letdown after that? I think they're in the right headspace mentally. I mean, it, had you seen signs last week of them kind of going through the motions against Kansas uh, yeah. ahead of this spot? Maybe you'd be a little bit concerned that they're putting too much into this game, but they just went out last week and just took care of business easily. Yeah. Um, I think they're rolling right now. I do think that it's going to be a high-scoring game because it just seems like this game always is, aside yeah, from last yeah. year when Oklahoma didn't score any points. Um, so I think Oklahoma could pro- probably get inside that number, but um, I think I like Texas to win the game. Yeah, I'm going to take Texas, and I'm going to take them because I need them to win. I want them to win. And I will always pull against RJ Young, but I'll take Texas uh, 41-37. All right. Bam and M. Let's let's do it. I mean, we got Billy coming out at 3 30. So let's let's do another game real quick before we jump into that. Like this one's gonna be fun. Yeah, let's spend a couple minutes on that. LSU, Missouri. Um, two teams that are two fan bases and two teams that probably are feeling completely different right now. Um yeah. we all it seems like we all watched the LSU Ole Miss game last week and saw just whatever that was that LSU called defense. Um, so this game is also at 12. It's on ESPN. LSU is still ranked number 23, though they are 3-2 and two, at number 21, Missouri, who is 5-0. and oh. Missouri is 6.5-point underdog at home, total 63. Um, LSU has already given up 31 points or more three times this season. Um, last week against Ole Miss, they gave up 389 passing yards and 317 rushing yards. Um, Coach Kelly said in one of his press conferences this week that 284 of Ole Miss's yards on offense came after contact on 34 missed tackles. <laughs> My favorite part about this whole thing is LSU is already in desperation mode, and I don't think they even have to be, but it's funny to watch because them bringing in an 82-year-old, ooh, just spit everywhere. 82-year-old defensive line coach. Yeah. To help out is like if he's gonna be able to connect with the uh, the youth of America today. Yeah. I mean, run for Congress, bro. Get a real job. <laughs> um LSU still kind of toying around with how they're gonna be successful on defense. And yeah, Coach Kelly basically like they started the year as a traditional four three. They went three three five against Ole Miss. It sounds like they're still gonna be moving parts around. They're just trying to figure out how to get the best players on the field and the best spots for them to perform. And I'm sorry, man, but we're in week six. You can't still be figuring that out. Nope. Um, obviously, the offense has been a, a bright spot. Um, we've gone over their numbers time and time again. For Missouri, um, they've covered the last three games. They're 5-0 and overall on the season. It's their best start since 2013 when they started 7-0. and uh, Brady Cook has been awesome. He's thrown for basically three 350 yards or more the last three games in a row. 11 touchdowns on the season, no picks. We've talked about Luther Burden, probably the best receiver in the country. What are your thoughts on this game here? So I'm going to do what everyone does. Okay, I'm going to take LSU to win because I just don't trust Mizzou in this spot. And, you know, like uh, there's so many good parts of this, of this Mizzou offense. I kind of already kind of gave it away and maybe, or maybe I just sold myself on, on my own, kind of confirmation bias on on this Missouri team because what I don't like about it is like I don't think anyone's going to stop LSU. I think when you look at LSU they're going to put up I think the bar is or like is set at 30, right? I don't see them being held under 30 points. I know what happened right. against Florida State, but they've been on a roll ever since then, right? Um I don't see anybody holding them under under 30 points. Mizzou's defense like I thought was going to be the strength of this team. Like if you would have told me it was 5 and 0s, I I would have thought it was like, well, I'm, I'm sure they're having to overcome Brady Cook errors. And, and he's like, you know, cause he's been so inconsistent in the past. He's been a top two or three quarterback in the sec. Luther burden leads the country in receiving yards. And the cool thing about this, this Missouri team that I really love to see is that they've gotten so much help outside 
of just those two players, right? Like they've actually like the, the skill position guys have been really, really good all year. I said this the other day and I keep coming back to it. I don't trust this Missouri team to have the ability to have that killer instinct. I don't, I don't feel like Mizzou is going to put their foot on someone's throat and not let up because you're going to have to do that with, with LSU. I mean, look at, look at how LSU like has won games or like the last two weeks, like they won a game and lost a game. They had a chance to win that game last week. And it like, even when they got the ball back with like 39 seconds left, they were in, in like scoring range against Arkansas. They drove all the way down the field after a tie game to get game winning field goal. Like they just keep coming and keep coming and keep coming, like just back from the dead. And I don't trust Mizzou to be able to, okay. <laughs> Jesus. Tyler was giving the uh, sign language sign for what I was just saying about them. Keep coming. Anyway, um, <laughs> no LSU. I, I just don't trust Mizzou's ability to put their foot on the LSU's throat and, and win. I, I will say maybe they cover the spread, but I think this is a game where we just have not been able to see against Vandy, against Memphis, MTSU, K state, like those offenses failed at times. And, and I don't think that, I don't think Mizzou as good as this offense has been is an offense that's going to be able to get into the forties or fifties that like we saw last week to hang with LSU. So I've got LSU to win. I'm going to say 38 to 33. Yeah, I, I've got a high-scoring one as well. I, I, I look at this game. The matchup that I love for Missouri is their passing game that has been really good against what is LSU's clear weakness on defense, True. which is their DBs. Missouri's got a pretty decent D-line, but they don't create a lot of havoc, and I think the way that you stop Jaden Daniels, really the only way that he's looked bad is when he's under pressure. Um, But when the O-line holds up, he's been basically elite. So... My gut feel on the game is just that LSU is reeling a little bit. I think the spot, like if this was a night game, I think it would be better for LSU almost. That's like a 12 p or 11 a.m. local game, 50 degrees, a little cold outside. Maybe it's a little sleepy game. Yeah, just those yeah. games I always feel like I turn on during the football season, and it's like Missouri and somebody, and like the team who's supposed to win that's on the road is just looking horrible. Maybe yeah. that's just every time I watch Florida go up there, but um, true. I, I don't know. For whatever reason, four, LSU four and four straight up and three and five against the spread in their last eight games, despite being favored in all of all of those but one. Um, the over is nine and zero oh in LSU's last nine games and seven and two in Missouri's last nine. So I like Missouri to get the win outright, thirty five, thirty three. So. Um, Love that for Missouri. I mean, that'd be great to start six and zero. I'd feel for LSU fans, obviously, if they go three and three. I think the matchup actually probably. I agree with you. I don't think Missouri could keep pace with LSU, but I just have a gut feeling on this one. That I'm going to go Missouri. What was the score? Thirty-five, thirty-three. Okay, we've got a little bit of technical difficulties, per usual, okay. with our good friend um, Billy Lucci. He's hard, he's having a hard time with what do you call it? Um, with Stream Yard. Yeah. So why don't you fill in some dead air here that I've created for no reason and um and we'll go from there. All right, let's let's go outside the SEC and go to Washington State UCLA. Yeah, this game that. intrigues me. Um I really have enjoyed watching Cam Ward um out at Washington State, the quarterback. Uh he's been the story obviously for Washington State. They're 4-0, number 13 in the country. This game, by the way, 3 o'clock on the Pac-12 network, so nobody's going to be able to watch it. But uh, number three, Washington State at no, UCLA. I, I have no idea. UCLA, a three-and-a-half point favorite at home, total 59. Um, like I said, love Cam Moore for Washington State. 1,400 yards passing, 13 touchdowns, no picks. He's top 25 in passing yards in the FBS, 10th in completion, 11th in passing touchdowns. Washington State as a team is second in the country in passing yards per game. Um, what I hate for Washington State in this game is their lead receiver, Lincoln Victor, suffered a high ankle sprain in the game last week against Oregon State. Doubtful mm -hmm. for this game. So um, it sounds like the coach, Coach Dickert, um, said that he's actually moving around okay, so he might play. I'd watch the status of that if you're actually going to bet on this game. On the other side of the ball, Dante Moore for UCLA. He's, he's going to be a really good QB. Really good. Exactly, um, 
there yet. Last week against Utah, he went 15 to 35 passing, and UCLA was third, three for 17 on third down. So um, when I look at the matchup, I like UCLA's rush attack. Carson Steele, the dude that looks like he is straight from like Los Angeles, um, just he looks like he should be surfing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love that rush attack versus Washington State's 91st ranked defensive uh, rushing success rate allowed. I think UCLA can put pressure on Cam Ward as well. They had four sacks against Utah last week. Um, and I think Washington State, all their big wins have been at home. They haven't really been tested on the road yet. So yeah. I like UCLA to win the game 30 to 28. Um, so I guess that would mean Washington State would cover the three and a half. But I like no, I like oh, yeah, okay. Um, I like Washington State because they're coming off a bye. And I like Cam Ward a lot. And I think that he's been we've seen Dante Moore start, struggle a little bit. I think they're coming off a bye too, but I'll take Washington State. I'll take them. 28 to 27. Let's bring in our good friend. I dressed up for him. That's how that's how good of a friend Billy is. This is amazing. Look, I spelled I mean, it right and everything. That looks like what you'd <laughs> wear if AM won and you'd lost some kind of bet. I mean, do you know you know where this came from? I did this last year going to the Auburn AM game, which yeah. I've said on this podcast a bazillion times. Tremendous experience, like tremendous experience. Admittedly, I fully went to go make fun of AM and the mm -hmm. midnight yell thing in Montgomery oh, yeah. that night. Everyone, they wouldn't let me wear this in. Okay. <laughs> so I spent $40 at Walmart for no reason. But now were I have this. You were the storm, were they afraid you were going to kind of sneak up there and not yeah. get caught and do the yell? <laughs> yeah. They, I fit in so well with my body type and overall, like just <laughs> positive personality that I was going to fit right in with the yell crew. Yeah. Um, but everyone was so nice. Like everyone was so incredibly nice. And I met, I met Kip. Happy birthday, Kip, if you're listening. Oh, yeah. um, and it was awesome, man. It was awesome. So I decided to break this out for you. Uh, cool. I love before it. Before we get I'm into wearing, the game, I'm wearing, old, I'm wearing old Miss powder yeah. blue over here. Yeah. Why? I don't, you know, I, some people say I don't have enough maroon in my, in my wardrobe. I, I do, but I feel like with all the maroon back here, if I wear like maroon or black, I kind of just blend into the set. Yeah, that's fair. I need to pop, Marler. <laughs> well, I hope you don't <laughs> pop too much during this, uh, this interview because I'm nervous as shit. We've already talked about this off air. I mean, you were texting back and forth about it. Um, kind of take us through, I mean, you do, nobody has a better job of covering Texas a and than you guys. Take us through like what the season's been like so far because I feel like everyone was dying to write off AM after that that Miami loss, just dying to do it. And they've just slowly but surely just stacked good weeks. And like what what's the overall mood throughout the season, but also right now going into this game? Throughout the season has been interesting because no one was ready to write them off more than the AM fan base themselves. And, and I and I understand big picture why, like how many years does AM go on the road in September and lose a non conference game that everyone's been looking forward to? I, I mean, I could educate you on AM history. It goes back long before Jimbo Fisher. It goes back, you know, all the way through even, even RC Slocum. Go, it goes yeah. all the way back. Um, and then on top of that, they're coming off five and seven. And just when everyone was starting to get excited with the way the last season ended, and you go out to Miami and you know, race out to a 10-0 lead and look so good and then you just kind of let it get away from you there. And I was with a lot of Aggies that were, you know, like you're all the way in Miami. You're just watching Texas beat Alabama that night. Okay. It was, uh, yeah. you, know, you guys know how the Bama fan base was that night too. I feel like both teams have been, had a similar path in terms of kind of getting back to where, well, wait a second, there's actually something on the table. And but it's cautious optimism. But I think it laid out guys for AM to do this because Auburn wasn't going to be that good and it was at home. And Arkansas, AM, no matter how crazy or close the games have been, they they've owned the Razorbacks. But mm -hmm. that game in particular, I thought was was going to be a pretty good tell. And yeah. Both these games, because of how AM won them, and I've got my guys sit here every Monday and complain. Sometimes I think they get confused and think that we are to the level of Bama or Georgia. Um, 
where you're supposed to blow out SEC teams. Both those games could have been a lot uglier than they were, but I keep pointing out you won two SEC West games by 17 and, and 12 points, and really yeah. neither of the games were that close. You, They were competitive into the third quarter, but you watched those games and you saw a, an A&M team that had way too much talent mm -hmm. for the Razorbacks and for, for the Tigers, and they physically – work both those teams over really you know they, they dominated the line of scrimmage in both games yeah. anyway. so i think the people that really watch that that that's why there's all of a sudden like okay damn it you've drugged me back in and i think the team in the last few weeks has looked like kind of the team that jimbo and the program insiders that i talked to all off season thought they thought they had Fair. which so is not a perfect one but it's a very good team yeah. What's the confidence level in, in Max Johnson? You know, Wegman unfortunately goes down for the for the year. And are they running the offense differently? You know, they've had now one full game where they were able to have Max prepare, you know, the offense under him. What looks different thus far under Max versus Connor Wegman? I I don't it didn't look that much different this week, although man, Max sure came out pushing the ball down the field. And, and you could see that Petrino had the utmost confidence in him. As a thrower, I don't know what's looked so much different so far. I think you'll see over time more play action. Max does such a good job with that. You saw him do it down on the goal line for the touchdown. He did it several other times. He, he's he's an excellent play action QB. Connor is better at eluding pressure. Mm -hmm. So you might see a little more six, sometimes even seven-man protection for Max. Uh, but Max – Throws as good a deep ball as I've seen from an AM quarterback in a while. I mean, he throws a beautiful deep ball and he is he does excel off that play action. But what else he is is whereas Connor does such a better job of eluding pressure and just kind of that's what separates Connor, I think, is that feel and how quickly he can get rid of the ball. But Max is a better runner. You okay. saw it against Arkansas, you you saw it. When he was at LSU, many times he hell he did it to A and M. If 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 he sees it in front of him, he'll take off and go. Whereas Connor is more of like getting away from that pressure and making throws down the field. Uh, so they're different. But it was very clear Saturday that Bobby Petrino has the utmost confidence in him because they came out firing uh, those in that first half against Arkansas. So I guess piggybacking off that because Petrino is. He's done a tremendous job, I think, so far. Anybody that's watched the SEC and thought he was going to fail, especially with the talent that they have in College Station, you're an idiot. Like, like he's he's got so much talent. He's I can't think of a single quarterback he's ever had at any stop he's had that hasn't overperformed, right? Like, he's been really, really good. So, looking at this matchup, and I'll say specifically with AM's offense versus Bama's defense, it's weird for me because you had the Anaya Smith comments yesterday, right? And he comes out, and, and I remember texting you about it, and you were like, yeah, well, he's gone off in every game he's played against Bama. And he has. Like, so that's like, like I, I look at this and I'm like, okay, Bama's played really well on defense. It's easily been the strongest part, besides maybe special teams, of this team mm -hmm. so far. But Stewart was a man among boys last year against Alabama. And you know that they're going to try to put him against, against Kool-Aid and, and maybe some of Terry and Arnold. But like, Anaya Smith got, got, has gotten his yards and gotten in the end zone four times against Bama in the last two years, right? Like Evan yeah. Stewart put up like or, like Stewart put up like ridiculous numbers last year. What do you think if you're a and offense, you're trying to attack the Bama defense this year? I think I would certainly try to see if you get the ball to the tight ends, Jake Johnson mm -hmm. and Max, right? Just as as chain movers. Um, and look, Jimbo Fisher. If, if you go back and look, even in losses, they've attacked Bama with the tight ends. Jalen Weidemeyer had that big game in the upset here. Last year, Donovan Green scored a touchdown, had a couple big catches. Uh, Jay Sternberger, I believe, scored. They, they had a walk-on tight end score uh, at Bama, I think, during 2020 season. So yeah. uh, they've gone after, I guess, for whatever reason, you know, Jimbo sees that. Now, it might be different without Pete Golding there but you know i think the tight ends will be one weapon because i do love those bama dbs there's no question yeah um but i i think you have to go after 
them down the field. You can't let Bama – because Aggies have to run Saturday to win, I believe. Right, not, right. not to some extreme level, but Le'Veon Moss is really coming on. Um, they just have to run effectively. And to do that, I, I think they – and I also think they're a big place to be had. I think they need to attack those Bama DBs down the field like they did last year, even with Haynes King. You know, he hit Moose Muhammad deep. He hit Evan twice deep down the field. I think mm-hmm. he may have hit another one to somebody for a good chunk play, like Texas did. I think you have to do that. Like Lane Kiffin, for God knows what reason, did not. Uh, yeah, he, he could have. have. Yeah, I didn't understand. But so I think you have to try it. And and it's yeah. like I said, it's Max's strength. Evan can go up and get it. Uh, Jade Walker can. He dropped a lot of passes last week, but he can go up and get it. We, you've seen what Moose Muhammad can do. But in particular, Evan Stewart and Noah Thomas. Yeah. That's a wild card because Noah had that massive first game, then he couple passes against Miami. But the last couple games he's been hurt. He lost his brother tragically a couple weeks okay. ago. Um, came back last week and wasn't too much of a factor. But if there's a player on A&M's team – that I could see that that no one's really talking about going in that could have a big game, it might actually be number three on offense for the same reason you said. Like, okay, Kool-Aid or, or whoever can cover him, but if you throw up a 50-50 ball, right. you know, it's five and is as fast as those guys and can go up and, and he, he'll go up and get it like Randy Moss if given the chance. So I think you have to hit a couple of those, and then you mentioned Anias. Yeah, and that's when Anias can really go to work on the underneath stuff. Yeah, I, I, the Bama yeah. defense versus a, the A and M offense is that's going to be a really fascinating matchup because, for as improved as the A and M offense is, I think the Bama defense has made you know mm-hmm. as many strides. And, and we sit there and I go, this A and M team for the first time, and I know in twenty twelve. They had Johnny, they had Mike, they had Ryan Swope, they had all those O-linemen. But still, the team that was put on the field, this is the first time that Texas A&M has as much talent as Bama. I think a couple years ago when they beat them, they could match them playmaker for playmaker because instead of having four first-round picks at receiver, they only had two. Yeah. Instead of having eight million first-round defensive linemen, they had one. You know, and, and yeah. But this year, across the board, A&M can match them talent for talent. They can match them momentum. They can match them mentally because they've beat them and took, taken them in the last play the last two years. They've played against Milrow. But I keep reminding A&M fans, and I may have to remind you, Marler, it's that okay. it's still the best defense Texas A&M will face all season. Right. right. And even though I'm saying they can match them talent-wise, it's still the most talented football team they'll play this season. There are some things that you certainly see that work in A&M's favor here, and that's rare in this matchup. We haven't seen that enough, and that's why I think so many people are interested in it. But this is still probably the best. Who knows what Miami will do in the ACC the next year yeah. we'll be telling. But it's probably the best team A&M plays this year. It's probably the best defense they play. Uh They've played running quarterbacks these last couple of weeks and done an amazing job. This will be the best running quarterback uh, that they face as a runner like, in terms of just being difficult to tackle. Yeah. yeah. So, man, it, it, it the matchup fascinates me, and I really could see it going either way. I could see it being like a 27-23 game either way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, you may have already answered this, but if A&M were to win this game, who's the player we're talking about? about you know the, had the best performance or was the reason why they came out and won that game i as much as i want to say levy on moss in the backfield um i think we'd be answering that question by saying max johnson if a and m wins again and i don't know if that means a a 210 yard two touchdown 40 yards rushing and and no turnover game um I don't suspect that Max will go off and just light up this defense because of everything we just said about this defense. Yeah. But 
I think this will come in some other SEC games, though. But you go back and look at his history. He has some games where he just says he'll just have an outburst, like against Ole Miss a few years ago. He threw for I think four thirty-five and three touchdowns. <laughs> he, you know, he's there's been a few games. I think he lit up Florida, uh, not yeah. the toss game, but the year before. I'm not expecting that, but. I do think if A&M wins, that that'll be the guy everybody's interviewing and, and talking to because he'll spread it around to all those receivers we just talked about. So I think it's it's Max or it's or it's Le'Veon Moss. But I think if they win, you give the game ball is going to be like, hey, that A&M defensive line will be a big part of the reason why they win because I think the the path to an Aggie victory means continued dominant. It leads through continued dominance up front by the by this Aggie front seven. Did I read correctly that they they've had two straight games of seven sacks and fifteen tackles for loss? That's fucking right. So they've had fourteen sacks and thirty tackles for loss the last two games, and it's jeez, yeah, it's well, been a wild turnaround because after Miami, everyone was had a big problem with DJ Dirk, and they were saying he was being way too passive, and and I I understand like let things play out. You know, I've done this too long. Whether it's beating the crap out of a top 10 South Carolina team that ended up firing or Steve Spurrier quit before the end of the season or blasting number 15 Arizona State and they go like two and six in the Pac-12, whatever. So I get just the tap the brakes, but I also understood like that was a very passive defense against Miami. I think in hindsight, though, I think you look back to that Miami game and it's one thing I said after and no one wanted to hear this, but this is the truth sometimes. Miami had a new offensive and new defensive coordinator, and they have an NFL-bound quarterback that was a senior. And, and pretty damn good talent. And you're on the road. And it just felt like when you look at this team now and you look at them then, it felt like Miami on both sides of the ball was just as blunt as I could be. It felt like they were doing things that A&M hadn't practiced. Yeah. The players looked on their heels. They looked confused in pass protection. They looked confused in coverage. Um, that's what it felt like to me. You played Miami of Ohio game one. You showed nothing. Your whole offseason was built around doing things that A&M you thought would have problems with, and I think that's what we saw. And I don't think that was the A&M team. That, th- this team is so much more aggressive on defense. They're getting after it. And, look, you all know this. The position where the Aggies have done – the best job of recruiting, probably as good as anyone in the country, including better. Bama and Georgia, probably better. Yeah, with the defensive line. And now, yep. last year they had a nice day against Bama, so that's something they can draw on. But those kids were, you know, Overton was out there at 17 years old. Uh, Walter Nolan was a true freshman. Shamar Stewart was a true freshman. Uh, Malik Silla, Eni White, all these guys were true freshmen last year. Now they've played a whole season of football and it's starting to show. And then you've got experienced guys like Diggs and Rakes and especially McKinley Jackson, Regis. They go so deep. I think I counted yeah. like nine guys played 19 snaps or more on the D-line last wow. week. And Auburn only – I mean, Arkansas only ran like – I think it was like under 60 plays. So they're just rolling them through and they're, they're, they're fresh and they're physical – and now they're experienced. No, yeah, that's all great, Billy, but you haven't run into a quarterback like Jalen Milrow that's going to go 13 of 18 for 163 yards and a hundred one touchdown, one interception, probably two. And this offensive line, I don't know if you've heard, but they're big, dude. They're big, uh-huh. and they're mad now. Like, they're mad now. They were saying that. <laughs> they're not necessarily good, but they are mad. Yeah. Guy popping off. It's always bad when the O linemen pop off. A few years ago, AM, and I'm not comparing AM to Clemson here, but AM was going to play Clemson. And it was, I think the year before, they took them to the final minute and they were going up to Death Valley. <clears throat> and the Aggies' starting guard guaranteed a victory in the press conference. And he kind of, I felt bad because he, the media, he kind of said something like, yeah, we, we intend to go up there and win, you know, just. Yeah. And the, the media guy goes, wait, is that you? Are you are, so did I hear that right? You guaranteeing a victory? He said, yeah, we're going there. And it, <laughs> they, the poor kid was just trying to sound confident to the media. And they, but when the old linemen start saying stuff, I don't care if it's Jimbo or Saban or whoever, they're, they're not going to be happy about it. But I'm no, with no. you. 
I'm with you. I know what you're saying about Milrow, and and he he won the game last year. I think he threw three touchdowns, but he also had a couple turnovers, threw a pick. I think fumbled, at least one of those fumbles or two he lost, right? Yeah. Bama yeah. turned it over four times. Like, I get what you're saying. I'm but, kidding about Milrow I, going to light y'all up, to be very clear. Well, I know you are, <laughs> but I'm also saying Milrow as a runner – Mm -hmm. is such a damn problem. The thing is, over a 60-minute game, you haven't seen him do it all the time, but against Texas, I was watching that game going, just get Run out of there and, and look down the field. And so he's he's scary. Yeah. <laughs> but I see why if you're a Bama fan, you know, you're like, okay, which quarterback have I been least excited about since since Saban's been here? And I don't know, yeah. is it Coker? Coker, no, because oh. the thing with Coker was that he came. He was a four-star guy from Florida State. Where I, I will never, I will never forget this. Brett McMurphy said in before the season started when they were giving their predictions, his Heisman Trophy prediction for 2014 was Jacob Coker, and I was like, we're gonna fucking win everything. Like we're we're the best team ever. And, and it was you like, did. He, no, we didn't. He did. He didn't uh, win the starting job. <laughs> he's uh, like, 15, <laughs> it's 15 when he won the title. Yeah. yeah. Despite everything he did, but he's doing a great job now with with Keller Williams Realty and Mobile or wherever the fuck he's at. So he's, I mean, um, okay. So listen, before we get you out of here, and again, really appreciate the time, man. I, I've I've been joking around with you, you know, all week about this game. I'm a little bit nervous, like I've said. Give us a prediction, and then I should have prepped you on this. And if you can't do it, then you don't have to do it. I'll just do it when you leave, and okay. then you, hopefully you don't listen to the podcast. But is there a, is there a Johnny story that you can tell on here? To our listeners, like a fun one that we didn't see yeah. from the 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 what do you go? Because you were all over that that um, the doctor yeah. was all. Awesome. Um, yeah, there is. I'm just trying to think of one. There are plenty that I could tell on air that are still good. Um, the, the Peach Bowl one was my favorite. We talked about it media days. I don't know if that's like off limits because that's like well, our that, of that night. Not off limits, but I just don't know. He has told me that's not true. Mm -hmm. Um, but I've had other people from coaches at that time on Sumlin staff to players say it was but Johnny would say it you know he would laugh about it. he's not the type and he certainly wouldn't tell me oh no I didn't do that like that's not if anything if it wasn't true and he thought it was funny he would go with it but that was <laughs> that he at halftime of that Duke game swigged uh one of those little that like size bottle of fireball fight. Yeah, fireball in the locker room in front of him <laughs> downed it chugged it and finished it um at halftime and then went out there and completed 21 of 22 or whatever it was against duke and maybe he was drunk because he's jumping on top of lineman's backs and spinning around and you know tugging on his you know but no i mean i don't know if that's but people have said that that we're in that locker room and people yeah. swear by it but johnny goes i didn't do that and lord knows what he's would confess to so that that was true well, that's that funny. was funny i think uh just a, a little more random one that's not anything too crazy, but at, there was one point he had kind of got in some trouble when he was with Cleveland, just kind of a perception trouble thing. And we were set to go to Cabo, and his group, lawyer, agent, and they called and said, hey, probably not the best idea for him to be in Cabo. Can you guys go somewhere normal? Sure. So we went. To Boston because he was set up kind of with the Fenway group owned. Uh, I think they were in sitting with LeBron's marketing company. Yeah. That's right. So we went up there and they had some stuff set up for Johnny, some business opportunities and meet people. And we sat in the owner suite at Fenway. And uh, I think they had us a place to stay in Cape Cod for after the few Red Sox games for the weekend. And it was a great time. You know, we're like, by the end of the Red Sox game, we're chest bumping the Red Sox owner in the suite. They they swept a doubleheader. And, all right, let's go to Cape Cod. And he goes, you know, did you bring your passport? Like, I was, I was like yeah, but we're not going. I'm not going to Cabo. And I'm damn sure not going to Cabo from Boston. Yeah. That's and, uh, well, next thing I know, I'm calling one of these MLB people that's with, you know, that group. And I'm saying, hey. I'm going with them to Toronto because okay. if I don't, you know, it's like, yeah, you what's going to happen? Be there and I'm not stopping this train. So we end up in Toronto the next morning and uh, 
think we're like in the booth and in the weekends right there after one of his concerts and well the next day we're sitting there at some pool party in toronto with all these nhl it was like uh, half the nhl was there and uh we're sitting there and johnny goes he's looking at his phone and he goes oh shit and i go what's i go what he goes just got drafted what do you mean you got drafted like what he goes, Padres just drafted me. <laughs> he, found out on Twitter. he found out on Twitter while at the pool party in, in Toronto that the Padres drafted him. And uh, next thing you know, I have to leave to come back to go to uh, – I have to leave to come back to go from, you know, eating at all Drake's favorite restaurants, going yeah. to all the clubs. His, his crew took us around. They were awesome, like the most fun – nicest people are still in touch with them they're so cool but flew from toronto to chicago to birmingham to hang out with you at sec media days and then while i'm in birmingham you know what him and our other buddy do Go to they cabo. fly from toronto to cabo yeah i was gonna say <laughs> and then then i went out and met them in uh in san diego uh and then i think me him and I was he was training with Whitfield and Jameis. Yeah. And uh we were down there. And so that was that was a week. And then he had a stop off, I know, in LA. And and what I missed that night, uh, I won't say on here. Nothing crazy, but just the amount of the people they were hanging out with that night in LA. And I'm like, damn it, SEC Media Days. <laughs> you screwed me again. <laughs> Well, listen, dude, um, I'm glad you went to SC Media Days this year because I got a chance to meet you randomly at way too early in the morning. Uh, yeah. Love all your work, man. A big, huge that's fan one of, of my, yours. Hey, that's my Mar – if someone asked me a Marler story, there you go. That's. I just want to be very clear <laughs> that my shirt was on. Shirtless my on shirt Broadway on. at 2 I was not shirtless. Early. Well, you I, I don't <laughs> have that kind of hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> I heard about no, the hot dogs. I spent – do you have any idea how many hot dogs I bought in two nights? I can't even imagine. 18. Oh, that's <laughs> low. That's low. What does that say well, about I me? I thought I was going to be 40. No, it wasn't that bad. I didn't have that kind of coin, dude. They were $8 a piece. It was <laughs> insane money. All right. I don't know if we even need to do this. We say it with everybody. Tell everyone where they can find you. I cannot say thank you enough for coming on here. I'd say best of luck, but I wouldn't mean we it. Didn't, we didn't get a prediction. Oh, yeah. Give us a prediction. 27-23. Uh, and I get, I, I actually am going to go A&M. And in full disclosure, I don't – I may have picked A&M twice to beat Bama in the history of this series, and it wasn't both times A&M won. I think I had them win in that 13 game. I did think they were going to pull it off in 12. Uh, yeah. But at that 13, those might have been the only times I've picked it, maybe once since. But I, I think A&M, if I, if I took out the feelings of it, and, I, and, and it wasn't us three sitting here or somebody, I, could, I think I would pick A&M to win this one Close, like I said, 27 23, that type of game. That's fair. All right, dude. We'll have to do it again soon when you guys are maybe in Atlanta or something like that. And um, and we yeah. appreciate it, bro. All right, appreciate you. And I know what you're doing. You guys are gonna try to end up in Atlanta again. Spoiled as hell. But who Bama fans? I'm just happy that you got you wore the overalls. It made my day. Look at the, I mean, the name and everything. And I've never yeah. worn overalls. And I've never worn boots and shorts as that meme that's going around that TikTok. Yeah, that's a tough one. Have, you, have I showed you the video? <laughs> there are a lot of people. I mean, you can't. It's undeniable when you see that. I didn't know that, that was like a like a like a like a snafu. Is that the right word? I don't even know how to, what I'm saying right now. Is that like like a, a fashion faux pas? What, I shorts and boots. Be, I think it would be most places, but yes. you know, yeah, here that's in Aguilar. And I'm all for it. You want to be in college and roll around and. I don't think I would have done it in college. I think yeah. that's bad I would have passed on. Never pierced my ear, never frosted my tips. I've fallen <laughs> for some of them. I think that one I would have passed on if that was a thing when I was in school. But to each their own. I, I do stupid things all the time. If we you do, that's fair. If we had if we had a bet, because I don't have hair right now, but we should have done a frosted tip bet. We'll have to do that next year. We'll do a frosted tip bet <laughs> I next think year. Taylor and I have some kind of bet going for this game. We haven't decided what yet. So if you want to. <laughs> uh you know commiserate with her y'all could come up with something i'm in i'm in yeah for sure i always like i always love when doring does this shit because it's always something he's like all right dude loser 
Loser has to walk shirtless down. And always something that he wants to do already. Yeah. And he's like, oh, this is so humiliating. I hate this. Yes. I hate having to slap on a, a skin tight baseball yeah. uniform and parade around the airport in it. <laughs> Dory so catching good. trays. All right, Billy. We'll talk to you soon, brother. I appreciate it. All right, man. Thank you, guys. Thanks. That was awesome. All right. So All right. Let's get to our picks here because. I don't think we're far off from what Billy said, right? Um, A&M Bama, we're talking about. That was a great interview. Fantastic interview, obviously. Oh, and I think I, I cut him off. But um, Billy Lucci from Tex Ags does a phenomenal job over there. All your A&M stuff. Love it to death. I'll let you start, Tyler. Okay. Um, huge game. 2.30 start Central Time. I don't know why I gave Central Time out since we're in the East Coast. Yep. Massive game. Take it away. Current line is Texas A&M plus two. Total of 47. Uh, I think we all remember the last time Bama went out to College Station. Bama was number one in the country. Texas A&M takes them down as time expires, 41-38. Outside of that, A&M, three, oh, including that, A&M is 3-12 and all-time versus Alabama. Uh, for, for Bama's side, Milrow had a, a good game last week. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, the A&M defense is significantly more talented than Mississippi State, but um, he did make his first career start, as Billy said, last year in that game when Bryce Young was hurt, and he passed for three touchdowns. They won the game. He did have a few turnovers. Um, yeah, three. Milrow has been sacked four or more times in three of his four starts this year, which is something to watch in this game because, as we said before, A&M, seven sacks in each of the last two games, 20 for the season. Um, I think Texas A&M has a better offense, even with Max Johnson than Bama does currently. Mm-hmm. Um, I wonder if Bama has enough juice on offense to convert in those key situations against Bama uh, AM's defense red zone, which they haven't been great at this year, and converting on third down consistently. I'm gonna go with Billy here. Uh, I think it'll be even closer. I'm taking AM 28, Bama 27. Um, I apologize, sir. No, that's fair. That's fair. Um, Listen, you guys know that on the show, I'm a diehard Bama fan, grew up that way. We'll make no apologies for it. Um, love it. I also love being objective. And I said this the other day on the College Chaps podcast, and I'll say it again on here. If there's anything I love more than Alabama football or sex, it's being right. And that's why I'm totally okay with what I said against Texas. And I'll probably be okay <laughs> with what I'm about to say here. Because I think it's going to play out that way. I think my lock of a week is Texas A&M. And Texas A&M is a two-and-a-half-point underdog at home. It started at three-and-a-half. I think it's come down a little bit. Um, before the season, it was like eight. And we've obviously watched Alabama uh, play themselves out of that. Here's the things that concern me. And, uh, you know, it's four straight games where you've been held to under 365 total yards of offense. Four straight games. It's the first time that's happened since 2015. Only the second time they've had four straight games in a row um, that they've done that. Um, since 2010, so in the last 14 years, it's something that, that you don't you don't see from a Bama offense. Now, I will say that they've been able to do stuff in other phases of the game. Obviously, they scored on defense last week. They were able to put 40 points. Still, very very concerning, right? We just saw what LSU did to, to Ole Miss's defense. Bama only put up 24 against that team, and it, it took a lot to do that. So, a lot of concern here. A lot of concern. I think. When you look at the things that concern me most, I brought this up on Sunday. AM is the only team in the SEC, and I believe the country, that has scored on their first two possessions in every single game they've played so far. I don't think Alabama's offense is built to come from behind. Um, and I, warned, I worry that if they get down early, they will not be able to keep up with them. Now, I will say, so far this season, all five teams Bama has faced, um, four of the first possessions were punts, and then one was a fumble last week against Mississippi State. That defense is going to have to win this game, I think, for Alabama. I think you have to finish plus two in the turnover margin because I don't trust Jalen Miller on the road yet because we haven't seen him really ball out or anything like that. It hasn't really been in that position, to be fair. We didn't see him at USF. He played really well against Mississippi State, but they yeah, didn't they put the game in his hands. He only threw the ball 12 times. I don't think this offense is going to be able to run the football at will um, or even like, like they were able to last week. So I think you do have to end up in the plus – territory in in turnovers i think you have to continue what the special teams have done for bama which has been really impressive you, you pin somebody at the one yard line uh love a good punt porn and we got to see it last week for bama for the first time seemingly like in forever will Riker to his last 24 field goals in a row knock on wood including his last 10 from 40 plus that has to continue 
But here's the thing, man. When you talk about where Bama has struggled the most in general as a program over the last couple of years when this stuff has started to decline, it's on the road. Even last year with Bryce, you, you averaged seven points less per game on the road versus at home. You averaged, I think it was like 170 yards of offense less at, at, on the road versus, versus – or they gave up. I'm sorry. You gave up 170 yards more per game on the road than you did at home. Then you talk about from a, like a, a penalty and, and discipline standpoint – Bama averaged four penalties more and over 28 yards more per game in penalties on the road versus at home. Are those things short up? Because who, I mean, like, you know, Deontay Lawson, who's supposed to be like the leader of this defense, he's been out. Now, to Bama's credit, they've had guys fill those spots. Like J- Jihad Campbell's been incredible. Been incredible. Him and Caleb Downs leading the S or leading the team and tackles. He's really been blowing up the D line. Jihad Campbell. <laughs> Jihad Campbell has gone to war every single game he's he's had to start. Um, I worry about the offensive line, and I remember talking to Chris Gordy about this, and he's like, you know, I just – INDs, more like IEDs, am I right? Okay, let's move on <laughs> from it. Um, so so what worries me is this. Hey, he brought up the fact that he's like, you know, looking – you're looking – stop laughing at your own jokes, idiot. Oh, um, let me do that. That's my thing. I forgot uh, we're pretty big in Asia, so we got to be careful. That's true. Stop. So, so, so like he brought up the fact that he was like, you know, I'm looking for a, a spot where it's like, who is going to be able to like separate this? So I was like, where's the difference? And like, you look at the the sacks they've had per game. A&M's had 20. I think Bama's had like 17. So it's pretty similar. Well, I mean, flip that around. A&M's had 20 sacks. How many sacks has Bama allowed? The second most in the SEC. I'll look it up right now. Um, so far this season, sacks allowed. Bama is second to last. They've given up 20 sacks, only, only in front of South Carolina. a and only allowed seven. That offensive line has been a lot better than Bama's offensive line. And this is probably the best defensive line they're going to face. And you saw what they said about DJ Durkin, bringing a lot more pressure. I think Bama has to get the screen game going, all that kind of stuff. I don't see them winning this game on the road in a very tough environment. I hate to say it. I think a and wins. They are a two-and-a-half-point underdog. I think they win outright. I have a and 28, Alabama 20. So all three of us picked AM. So I look forward to celebrating the Bama victory after the game with you, buddy. Roll, Tad. All right, let's go through some quick games before we get to the, the big night game. Yeah. Uh, Notre Dame is going on the road yet again to another ranked team. Uh, this is at 7.30 on ABC. Number 10, Notre Dame at number 25, Louisville. Louisville is six and a half point underdog at home. Total 54 and a half. Um, Notre Dame has won all five matchups they've had with them head to head. It's on the road, right? It is on the road. I just, I watched Louisville against, I actually bet on them minus three against NC State last week on the Friday game, and they didn't look great. I think that their offensive metrics that because they're they're top fifteen in on offense and defense. Yeah. If you look at just like total metrics and stuff. Um you take that. No. So um actually I, I probably do, but we're podding. We're podding. Um not so hard. Pod's playing. So I, I just I like if anything in this game, I like Notre Dame to win. And I I think for my score, I've got Louisville covering. If anything, I like the under in this game because I, I really like Notre Dame's defense. I don't think Louisville is going to run up and down on them or pass up and down on them for that matter. Um and I and Louisville's actually got a pretty good defense themselves. Duke's yeah. going off two really tough games. So I like the under the best in this game, but for the score, I'll go 28 Notre Dame. Uh, Louisville 24. Yeah. So um, I thought it was interesting. Josh Pate brought this up the other day and I trust everything Josh Pate says well, or way more than I in things I say. Um, Josh Pate brought the fact that he thinks Louisville should be favored in this game. Now it's going to be tough for Notre Dame because you're talking about getting up for three straight weeks against good competition. Right. And, and I tell you what, three straight weeks where you're somebody's Super Bowl, And, and I'm, I'm sure Notre Dame to an extent is kind of used to that, but like this team's not like maybe mm. Notre Dame in the past, like, for three straight weeks, I mean, to have the Ohio State game and host game day, then go to Duke and, and have to, like, I mean, eke out a victory where your offense didn't do anything for four quarters. Now, the good news is this. I've watched Louisville twice this year. Um, they've won both games. They're undefeated, right? Like, they've they've won against NC State. They won against Georgia Tech. But they found themselves in a hole in both those games by double digits. And I think that that worries me because, granted, both those games are away from home. I don't think 
fucking Papa John Stadium or whatever it's called is going to necessarily be like off the chain this weekend. Right. I trust Sam Hartman as a 11th year quarterback more than I trust anything with Louisville. I think it'll be more high scoring than we've seen, especially over the last two weeks. But I don't think that Louisville is as physical as Notre Dame. So if you're trying to keep ball control and continue to put up points, I trust Notre Dame to do that. I'm going to say Notre Dame 30 to 24. All right. Um, and then we've got noon on Fox. This game is not exactly a, a close spread, but I think it's an interesting game. It's uh, Maryland at number four, Ohio State. Is, Ohio State, 18 and a half point favorite. Real total quick, hand and down the worst graphic I've made out of any of these. I don't it know how like, we even made it to the final cutting room. This is insanely bad. It looks like it's the head of the turtle on the other side. It does. It looks like <laughs> Wilson from Home Improvement. <laughs> and, then, the uh, and then <laughs> this uh, hand skin turtle over here. Um, this is going to be a good game. So here's the thing about this game. Yeah. We talked about this at the start of the year. When this game, like looking at Ohio State, if they were going to drop a game and they haven't done that yet or they're coming off a bye, but you kind of feel like it's going to be in this next little wave of games, right? Ohio State is coming in, and when you talk about – hold on. Um, I'm trying to pull up their, their schedule right now because I don't have it memorized by any means. When you talk about like like the way their schedule plays out, they have this game, right? You just, you just escaped Notre Dame. Then you've got at Purdue, Penn State at home, at Wisconsin – at Rutgers, who's been better than people think? Like this is a tough little stretch. It's as tough as it's going to get in the SEC or in the, in the Big Ten. This, I think, is a very tough game. I think they're fortunate it's at home because Maryland has been really, really good. You have some numbers on on them, and I'll I'll, I'll defer to you or default to you in a second. But like Talia Tungavailoa has been incredible, yeah. top ten quarterback probably nationally in a lot of ways. He's he's done everything in, in Mike Locksley's offense that you would want. Um, and I will call it Mike Locksley's, Mike Locksley's offense because I hate Josh Gaddis still and always will. But they've been really, really good. Now, where I do get concerned sometimes, like they you saw them against Michigan State. They came out, put on the gas, didn't let up, put up a ton of points early. Same thing last week. I think Talia's over under for for touchdowns or touchdown passes was one and a half. He did it in the first like six minutes of the game. He's got to absolutely ball out. They they cannot. There's no part of this team that they cannot win or they can lose a battle in. They can't they they have to win special teams. They cannot turn the ball over. They have to they have to play good defense and limit the scoring. What are your thoughts? Um so first five and a start for Maryland since 2001. Mm -hmm. Um 15th nationally in points per game on offense, 16th nationally in points per game on defense. So they've been really good on both sides of the ball. Um the thing that kind of gets me is you look at Ohio State, they're four and a, Four and zero at home against Maryland uh, with an average score of sixty-two to eighteen, mm -hmm. which isn't great. Uh, the last three times they've played Maryland at home, they've scored at least sixty-two points. Yeah. Um, also, Maryland has, has been known over the last couple of years under Locksley for starting fast. They've been twelve and one in September over the last three seasons, but then have gone on and to fall off. They've gone a combined eight and ten the rest of the way the last two years. So. Um, if you look at advanced analytics, the two teams have been very similar um, offensively. Ohio mm -hmm. State a little bit better. Uh, both are good at staying ahead of the chains. Ohio State's a little bit more explosive. Maryland has a lot more trips and you know across the fifty to the uh, opponent's side of the field. Both are really good when they get on the opponent's side of the field of cashing in for points. But what separates this team uh, or the the teams in this game is the defense. Ohio State's been really good on defense. They're they're good at really good at limiting long drives, which is kind of been Maryland's thing. They're not too explosive. They've created more havoc than Maryland has, and I just think the line is probably too high because it it just screams it's eighteen and a half, and it screams like backdoor cover for Maryland to me. I don't think Ohio State's ever going to sweat this game. Um, I've got 38-20, which would technically put Maryland as a cover with the hook. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't think it. I don't. I don't see Ohio State going off for 62 in this game like they have been the last couple of years. You want to hear a crazy stat about Ryan Day? You do. Okay, he's been there. This is his fifth season, right, as the head coach. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to include the COVID year, okay, where they had multiple bye weeks. Ryan Day off a of bye. Okay. Okay. Here's here's the numbers of those games, the margin of victory from those games. 49, 40, 
seven, 47, and 44. In five games that he's had where he's come off a bye week for this team, they have won those games by 40 points or more in four of the five games. So I think Ohio State gets it going. I think they make some adjustments. They're coming off a huge win, and they still have a chip on their shoulder. I, I think Maryland is good. I think they're a good team. I think it'll be close in the first half. I think this is a game where it's like Ohio State can look across the country and be like, this is a 5-0 and Maryland team. They're somehow not ranked. But we know what that offense can do. Watch what our defense can do. Because that's the other thing we were talking about with, with Notre Dame going into that, that game was like, Sam Hartman's put up like 14 touchdowns, no interceptions. He's been incredible. Like, Ohio State's defense is really, really good. And I, I guarantee you, I don't know how many touchdowns Talia will throw for, but that defensive line is way better than Maryland's offensive line. So I will take Ohio State to win and cover. I'll say 44 to 20. Okay. In the last game here, uh, before we get to the our best game? bets. Yeah, before we get to our best bets. Uh, 7 p.m. on ESPN. Number 20, Kentucky, at number one, Georgia. Georgia currently a 14-and-a-half-point favorite. Total is 48. Um, Georgia's beaten Kentucky 13 consecutive times. Um, how do you see this game playing out? And then I'll tell you mine. God, I hope Kentucky wins right off the bat. I'll just say it. Yeah. So, how do I see this game playing out? Um, it worries me. Um because all of the things I love to look at things logically and reasonably like, well, with football, not with like my life, but like with football, especially and looking at Kentucky in just the last week. Okay. Auburn, like I said, on Sunday woke up last Saturday and chose violence and decided they were going to, the key to their victory was running the football into the teeth of what has been the best defense in the country seemingly every year for the past four or five years under Kirby smart right now mm -hmm. they ran the ball for almost five yards of carry most yards against Georgia since 2018 LSU most carries against Georgia in the last five years. I like Ray Davis is coming off a 280 yard game. And he even said in the post game, it's like, you know, that big blue wall and the offensive line, they they're kind of back to it. And Liam Cohen has had really good success in the, in the game he had against Georgia a couple of years ago, that was it was one of their closer games of the season, especially in the regular season in, in 2021. Devin Leary, is he going to be able to play mistake free football? Because that has been a, a thing that's plagued him, right? They've played the 124th ranked strength of schedule. They're going to be on the road. I don't believe they had to leave home yet. I'm sure they have because they played five games, but like if they have, it's probably it hasn't been far, right? Um, oh, they played at Vandy. <laughs> so there you go. Um they got to go two athletes and workers just sitting there doing their day job. That is such a weird, weird thing. Just a guy with marble reds dangling from his mouth, high fiving you when you score a touchdown. It's fucking bizarre. But I think that this is a game where I I hope Kentucky, I think it opened at 17. It's down to 14, right? Georgia was a 14 point favorite a week ago. The difference in that is they're at home and Georgia has protected Sanford really, really well. Carson Beck is somehow quietly being like one of the best quarterbacks in the country from an efficiency standpoint. He just doesn't have like, like Carson Beck is like, he's hitting 380, but he's only got 12 home runs. And it's like, oh, so he's not, he's not that great. Like he's not doing the flashy things. And 380, I think is a stretch, maybe 310. Mm, he was, he was eight, 80% last week on third downs and, uh, and in the fourth quarter. So I just have a feeling like, can, like Georgia has not done a good job at stopping the run, that we're setting the edge, all that kind of stuff, or, or whatever, like like Kirby was talking about last week. Kentucky's got a lot of confidence coming into this game, I'm sure. They've got a good quarterback. They've got a great receiving core, all that kind of stuff. Where I struggle with this is it just, for whatever reason, to me, it reeks one of those games that Georgia wakes up, gets out of the slumber, and I think not only wins the game, but jumps on them early. I will tell you this, though, and I want you to remind me of this. If they fucking don't, if Georgia, even if they win and it's another slow start, on Sunday, I need you or somebody in our in our audience to call in and remind me, like, hey, you said this. I'm off the train. I'm off the 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 midnight train to Georgia, okay? Because, like, like there's only so many times we can give them the benefit of the doubt, and they look 
average to slightly above average, and that's what they've looked like so far this year. But I will do it one more time and say that Georgia wins. They win big. I think they prove a point. I'm going to say Georgia 34 to 10. Um, I think Carson Brett, Car- Carson Beck, you'll continue to see progress in this game. Yeah. Um, Georgia actually hasn't been very, like, for their standard, has not been very good at stopping the run this year. No. Um, so I think Kentucky could actually get some some ground game going here, but nothing like the Florida game. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Um, but the offensive passing game still really hasn't taken off yet, and because of that, I don't see how they they'd have to have both things working well to win this game. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't expect that to happen in this game. Georgia still. I, I let me just confirm. Yes, they still do have Brock Bowers. Um, God. And anytime you have him on offense, you're gonna have a chance. Uh, low scoring affair. I like the under in this game. I'll take Kentucky to cover, but I, I I'm not with you yet. I don't think this is the week that Georgia comes out, and I, I just don't trust them yet. I got to see it first. So UGA twenty eight, Kentucky seventeen. Okay. Um, you have your best bets. I don't have my best bets. Okay, that's yet. fine. I'll read these, and then I want to encourage uh, the audience too. If you Feel like you have a best bet and you want to throw it throw it yeah. in the voicemail ahead of, ahead of time please call us the best bets if if you maybe go head to head against us mm-hmm. or you just have some good stuff that you want to put out there call us leave us a voicemail and if it's good we'll play it on the show uh my best bet leave us a voicemail real quick and send them to us and then like through the voicemail and mm-hmm. then we will we will post them in like a like a graphic or something like that for the game too Okay. Uh, the so to remind you, the hotline is seven seven zero six seven four eight two three three. My best bets: Nebraska plus three and a half. I think Illinois stinks. They're zero and five against the spread in their last five. Nebraska might have actually found something at quarterback. So I'll take Nebraska on the road to cover the with the hook. I like Virginia Tech in the first quarter against Florida State plus six and a half. Uh, Florida State's been slow. Uh, had a slow start in pretty much all their games this year. I also like the over for the total in that game of 53. All of Florida State's games have gone over 53 points this year. Um, UCLA minus three. I'm going to I'm gonna take that. Uh, if it gets back down, right now it's three and a half. But if we have the hook, take away. UCLA minus three, I like that. Iowa minus two and a half against Purdue. Like, Ooh. I get it. Iowa sucks, but... So and Purdue. they lost the quarterback, Cade, Cade McNamara. But I think any Iowa quarterback, you just throw anybody in there, they'll put the same stats up. I don't think it matters that much. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, that is like opened, the Mercury Sable and Ford Taurus of, of yeah. fucking. Yeah. That's, that's perfect. The game opened at minus four and it's moved down through minus three to minus two and a half. So I'll take Iowa there. And then I like the under in both the UJ Kentucky game and the Notre Dame Louisville game. I love it. We'll have a graphic up for it on, on Friday or, or obviously before Saturday. Yeah, but send us your best bets. Send us voicemails again. The the phone number from that, 770-674-8233. We had some really good ones this week. We'll have that up with our, our um, weekly series now with Angry Fans. And uh, Tyler, take us out. Yeah, that's the end of the show. So we appreciate you guys tuning in. As always, we, we uh, appreciate you listening to the show. We appreciate you sharing the, the show with your friends. It would really help us and the growth of the show if you would rate us five stars on apple and spotify leave us a review we'll read the best ones here on air like and subscribe to our youtube page leave a message or the hotline 770-674-8233 don't forget to check out the videos and clips from the show at sat down south on twitter at saturday down south on tiktok and instagram and at saturday down south one on youtube for chris i'm tyler that's the show good luck this weekend and give us a call Oh, uh-huh.